the cycling podcast in association with Rafa. From grand tours to group rides, the Champs Elysees to coffee shops, Rafa exists to celebrate the world's most beautiful sport. Where are we, Lionel? Uh, Daniel. Um, <laughs> we're going to try and confuse people straight away. We are. Um, I'm Daniel, not Lionel, and we're in um, Palma, Mallorca. What, what the hell are you doing here? I find myself here in the centre of Palma with you, Daniel, on a family holiday, actually. I've broken off from my family uh, to join you for a bit of podcasting. We are a man down, unfortunately. Lionel was going to join us. Couldn't make it to Mallorca, could he? He couldn't make it. He's unwell. Probably a bit too warm for Lionel already. Um, it's about 16 degrees, <laughs> um, 13 in the shade. <laughs> Oh, he'd be uncomfortable. Yeah, he's he's unwell. Not nothing serious. Don't worry. Um, just a cold, I think. Sniffling. I'm I'm a bit under the weather myself as well. But I'm you know. I'm 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 braving it. I saw some quotes the other day from Nathan Haas of Katuja Alpacin about uh, riders, pro riders nowadays, almost constantly, or a lot of them constantly being subpar. Um, as far as their health is concerned, uh, overtrained. I think the same applies to podcasters, doesn't it? It does. And interesting you should say that, Daniel, because we have an interview in this week's episode, and that sets up very nicely with Jeroen Swart, who's a new head of medicine or medical director at Team UAE Emirates, and he talks about that very subject, about riders being uh, constantly overtrained, overraced, and fat- in a state of fatigue. Also, Rich, is a bit of a postscript to our discussion a few weeks ago about Strava Neue, which went viral. Well, it, it certainly made the press in Belgium. Um, Strava Neue, we came up with this, this term uh, to describe the feeling of sort of anxiety and insecurity that grips pro riders. But not just pro riders, amateurs as well, when they think that um, based on other people's Strava, they're not training enough. Um, I, I understand that Lawrence Ten Dam talks about this in his podcast, rival podcast, but it's okay because it's in Dutch, um, this week, and he said that um, he's he's pretty appalled by some of the, well, the amount of training that some of his younger colleagues are doing, and he thinks they'll all be overtrained by April. It's a bit of a theme this year, isn't it? And, and Mark Cavendish hinted at it in our interview last week, that the, talking about the younger generation and how... Um, well, how dedicated they are to training and how sort of focused they are on numbers and, and data and what's and so forth. And, um, yeah, some of the older guys are feeling a little bit um, sort of off the back. And Nathan Haas is below par himself, isn't he? He's, he's had some health issues the last couple of years um, and apparently is, uh, again, sort of been sent away for further investigations, examinations, before he resumes his season for Katusha Alpsen. But... He, uh, he went out to the Tour of Oman and, and uh, hasn't finished. He's come home. So uh, he, he, that's a shame for him because he looked a couple of years ago to be on, on the verge of some, some big results. And he was obviously signed by Katusha Alberson with that in mind. Uh, shall I crack on with the news roundup, Daniel? You don't have to ask, Rich. Well, it's, um, Lionel's been good enough to send from his sick bed some notes for the news roundup. So... Any factual inaccuracies here are entirely down to Lionel. Shall we do a free-flowing jazz news roundup again? Let's give it a go. Well, there's quite a lot to, to pack in. I mean, a huge week for Astana, first of all. Eight wins in six days. If that's incorrect, it's Lionel's fault. For, between That's between the 15th and 18th of February. By five different riders in four different countries. Colombia, France, Spain and Oman. In Colombia, and we'll talk about this a little bit, there was the the very snappily named Tour Colombia 2.1. What do we think about that? The, the race or the name? The name. Um, yeah, it's um, it's not the most imaginative or the or the snappiest, is it? No, but it was some race, and it was won by Astana's Miguel Angel Lopez. The top six overall were all Colombian: uh, Ivan Sosa, Dani Martinez, Egan Bernal, Nairo Quintana, Rigoberto Urán. We're all there. The first non-Colombian was Julian Alaphilippe in seventh, and he was a stage winner along with his teammates Ali Hodge and Bob Jungels. Uh, Juan Milano and Quint- Nairo Quintana won the other two stages in Provence, where I saw Bernard Tappy made an appearance. Uh, Bernard Tappy, of course, ran the Lavie Claire team back in 1985 and 86, and um, 
haven't seen him at a bike race for many years. There was a bit of a Lavie Claire reunion, which was interesting. Some old old characters, but Jean Francois Bernard was there. Um, he was once Tappy's favourite son. They gave him a, a Ferrari, I think, when he won a stage of the Tour de France uh, in '86. Um, but Tappy's aged very quickly. It seems very very quickly. He has been unwell, um, and it was uh, it was quite surreal to see. Tappy's charisma is still very much intact. I don't know if you did you see that bit of footage, Daniel? I didn't. But I followed uh, the reports about his ill health over the last uh, two or three years. I think he's had been suffering some kind of cancer, hasn't he? Anyway, Rich, never mind Tappy. What's happened to Andrea Taffy's bid to ride Paris Roubaix? We're lacking an update on that. Anything in Napalm's notes about that? Nothing. I don't think it's going to happen, is it? It's not looking good. He has not, as we speak, uh, got a ride with a team, it seems. So. At 52 years old, his dream of one final Pyro Bay may be dead in the water. Uh, Bernard Tappy, as I said, was at um, Provence, uh, in Provence for the Tour de la Provence, um, which was won by Gorka Izagiri, one of Astana's new signings, after his brother, Jan, won in Valencia recently. Um, it was very close overall, with only a second splitting the top three. Simon Clark and Tony Galapan were also on the podium uh, in Murcia more Astana success at the Vuelta a Murcia uh, where Leo, Luis Leon Sanchez and Peo Bilbao finished first and third and won both stages Alejandro Valverde the world champion was second overall in Oman well we're speaking just after the Green Mountain stage on Wednesday which was won by Alexei Lutsenko he also won stages three and four and he looks likely to win for the second year in succession when the race finishes on Thursday. Uh, Lutsenko is a bit like the sort of Simon Spielak of the Tour of Oman, isn't he? Spielak traditionally rides well in a couple of races in Switzerland, and this is the, the race that Lutsenko seems to enjoy most of all. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Rich. We talked a couple of weeks ago about Tim Wellens and how he has tended to target the very early season races sort of acknowledging that that's probably his best chance of, of success in the season um, and Lutsenko seems to be similar um, but having said that he's a rider who's been sort of bubbling under for a, a few years now um, I saw him compared to Moreno Argentine by um, Roberto Damiani the Cofidis direct sportive I thought it was an interesting shout I would say that Argentine was probably a bit punchier Argentine of course won Liege Baston Liege three times uh, Flesh while on, I think, four times. So he was the, the certainly the best Arden Classics rider of his generation. Lutsenko hasn't produced that kind of performance yet in the Arden, but he's someone to look out for in those races. Maybe a similar build, quite stocky. Um, but yeah, he's not. He, he was quite emotional when he won at Green Mountain. Said that his his wife had a miscarriage at the end of last year and lost twins. That was very sad. Um, but as I say, he's set to win the Tour of Oman for a second in a row. Other stages won by Alex- Alexander Christoph of UAE Team Emirates. Continuing their good start to the season. And Sonny Colbrelli. Stop press, erratum. Um, Moreno Argentine won liege Basson liege four times. And Flesh won on three times. At the Trofea La Guelia. Uh, I think I said that correctly. First time round, Daniel. Just call it the Trofeo Pippo Pozzato. Well, it synonymous. was synonymous with the Peacock of San Diego. That race, of course, he won it three times, but alas, is now roller hockey player. Well, it was won this time by Simone Velasco with a 42-kilometer break. Um, his team, Nero Sotoli, uh, missed out on a place at the Giro this year, but that was a, a phenomenal uh, performance from him, and he was very emotional at the finish uh, of that race. Did you see much of that, Daniel? What did you think of that? Well, it was, it was a bit of a shock. Like, Guelia is not the race that it used to be. The field isn't the strongest. But um, the Velasco's team, Neri Sotoli, are pretty aggrieved not to have received a wild card for the Giro. And um, it was a massive result for them. Um, I saw people from that team talking about it. It's one of the best days in that team's history. That team, of course, has been... Um, had various different names in the past Farnese Vini Fantini Vini um, but it's Luca Shinto's team so yeah big feather in their cap at the Classica de Almeria which I watched it finished in Roquetas de Mar uh, where Simon Clark won a stage of the 2018 Vuelta you might remember that it was a, a long awaited win for education first uh, but at the Classica de Almeria uh, Pascal Ackerman uh, the German champion 
uh, sprinter on Bora Hansgrohe. He won that. Uh, well ridden by his team, Bora Hansgrohe. They had a, quite a few guys at the finish to help him. He looked quite nervous. He kept uh, fiddling with his shoes, tightening his uh, Velcro straps and so on. And um, he won ahead of Marcel Kittel. Now, Kittel, I don't think there's anything wrong with Kittel physically, but uh, he was badly positioned in a very small group of only about 25 riders. He managed somehow to lose his lead-out man, Marco Haller. What, it made me think of a joke, actually, Daniel. What, what do you call um, a lead-out man who's lost his sprinter? Go on, Rich. A man. Anyway, Marco Haller looked... <laughs> completely at sea uh, as he was uh, preparing to lead out uh, Kittel and Kittel was nowhere to be seen. Now Kittel came from a, a long way back and he looked strong and he was certainly finishing a lot quicker than Ackerman but Ackerman won and Ackerman is a young German sprinter who's got a place in the Bora Hanscourt team at the Giro this year and there's probably quite a lot of pressure on him as well because he's he's edged out Sam Bennett for that spot effectively um, uh, and that will that win will have done him no harm at all but as I say I don't think there's anything wrong with Kittel physically that was just a case of bad positioning and uh, bad judgement uh, coming up in the next week we've got Ruta del Sol uh, the Tour of Algarve Tour de Var where Roman Bardet makes his seasonal debut and the next World Tour race is the UAE Tour which starts on Sunday. Some non-racing news. Uh, well, we'll talk a little bit about this later on, but maybe a, a, a little update on the search for a new sponsor for Team Sky. Uh, a, a good news story, well, it's turned in, into a good news story. Um, the junior edition of Pyro Bay's future was in some jeopardy because of a funding shortfall. Uh, John Denkob, the 2015 winner of Pyro Bay, launched a crowdfunding appeal to raise €10,000 to save the race. He donated a quarter of that amount himself, and the, the, the target was reached pretty easily. It now stands at €16,000 as I speak. Former winners of that race include Geraint Thomas, uh, Guillaume van Kiersburg, Jasper Stuyven, and Tom Pidcock. Um, so that Jaroslav Popovich. Jaroslav Popovich and Andrew Fenn, in fact, ahead of Peter Sagan several years ago. So... That's great news, and uh, I think um, reflects very well on Degen Cobb that he put his money where his mouth is and helped save Junior Pyro Bay. Um, more sadly, the RAS in Ireland, iconic stage race in Ireland, um, has been cancelled also due to the lack of a, a title sponsor. Very sad news, it's been around for many, many years. Um, and has had very many illustrious competitors in the RAS in Ireland, hasn't it, Daniel? William, William Fotheringham. <laughs> uh, winner, pre- previous winners include Stephen Roach in 1979, and M- Tony Martin in 2007, and Lucas Postelberger in 2015. So very sad news about the RAS. Uh, other news that I'm particularly interested in, Bart de Klerk of Wante Group Gobert became the first professional to race with an artificial hip. Uh, started at the Tour of Oman. He's 32 years old and he had a, a year and a half out as he adjusted to his new hip and he's this back is, racing. This is news close to your heart, isn't it, Rich? It is amazingly. Uh, this is all. These are all based on Lionel's notes. Remarkable. Um, second mistake, second erratum of the podcast so far. Not going too well. Napalm, SOS. Uh, Popovich did not win the junior Paris Bay. He won the <laughs> under-23 Paris Bay. A community around the world. Stories and films with the most compelling characters. The world's finest apparel. Explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Thank you very much indeed to our title sponsors, Rafa. Grateful to them as ever for their support. I'm just looking on the Rafa website there. Who's that modelling the new Pro Team bib shorts, Daniel? It's not Richard Moore. Um, Um... Mike Woods? It is Mike Woods. It is Mike Woods. They've obviously roped the Education First Riders into modelling. Uh, one of our uh, members of our one of the members of our team, Tom Wally, producer extraordinaire and someone whose voice you will have heard on the Explore series of podcasts. He is actually at the Education First training camp as we speak and in Girona and uh, we'll hear some interviews that he's doing there in the coming weeks. Also a bit of a, a Mike Woods doppelganger, isn't he? That's a good. He is. He does. He does look like Mike Woods. That's a good point. Yeah, that will not come across 
I don't think, in the interviews. However, um, Daniel, we were going to just turn our attention a little bit to Colombia. A lot of people talking about the Tour Colombia 2.1, as it's known. Um, I don't know how much of the race you were able to see, but it was extraordinary. There were extraordinary scenes. The crowds, the racing itself was almost, whenever I, I managed to see it, it was like a throwback to a different era. There was the stage that um, Julian Alaphilippe won in particular, I thought, it was, I don't know. It was, it was like watching something from the eighties. There was, there were guys just going at, going at each other. Um, there was no sort. Of, didn't look like there was any calculation, no um, conserving of energy. It was just attack after attack, very aggressive, uh, thrilling to watch. And uh, it looked like I don't know a cross between schoolboy racing and old school racing. Yeah, absolutely, Rich. Um, the racing itself was, as you say, a bit of a throwback. But, you know, I think part of that was due to, well, is due to the kind of atmosphere at that at that race. Um, you know, it's, it's no secret. Everyone will have seen that the, the crowds are incredible um, and have been incredible the first two editions of that race. Um, but it's also a throwback in the sense that, you know, without wanting to patronise the, the Colombian sort of cycling public, um, it's a different demographic. Um, it's a pop. It's still a, very much a popular sort of working class, lower middle, lower middle class sport in in Colombia, as it used to be in Italy and Spain, and and um, you know it, it makes for a completely different vibe, and it's a fantastic spectacle. And I think that the riders are inclined to to come out of their shell in that environment. And of course, you've got this well fantastic generation of Colombian riders which has emerged, and you know, it reminds me a little bit of the Tour of California when that was in February, or in just in the, the three or four years after its inception. Um, it, it's it was very early in the season. People thought that the, the top riders wouldn't be at their best, and that it might be a bit of an anticlimax. But I actually thought it was a better um, event back then because. You know, if you you built it, they did come. Um, as in, you put on a, a big, prestigious, and well-supported race for the local riders, or in their in their home regions, in their hometowns, and they can't help but get motivated and train and prepare for for that race. And and that's what we saw in Colombia. You know, guys that we that shouldn't really be peaking for three or four months. Um, very much well certainly competitive and, and and in pretty decent form you know that it was the best riders in the field were the ones that that came to the top so the um, superman lopez is quintana bernal and ivan sosa as well and it was great to hear the the colombian commentary um and uh you know hear the the sort of affection and esteem in which those guys are held and how these these nicknames are just thrown in there. Super, it's never Lopez. It's always Superman Lopez, and, and also Nairo Man. Nairo Man. I mean, Nairo Man. It seems almost unfair that you've got two superheroes competing against you know a field of mere mortals. Nairo Man. I don't know. Yeah, Nairo Man in his little cape. Um, it's funny that was last year was the first year that 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 race attracted a sort of a big field and and was held at this time of year and. Already, you know, second edition, it's it's established as it seems it's got this momentum behind it now. You can imagine this is going to become a, a real fixture on the calendar. Yeah, I mean, the the president of the Colombian Cycling Federation has said that it's going to take um, two or three years for it to to probably get all category status and and the and world tour status is is sort of further away on the horizon um, I think it's going to go it's going to go up one day next year so it's going to go from six days to seven days they're talking about moving regions as well going to um, the Bogota region um, this year it was it was very much based around well Medellin and Antioquia um, so Rigoberto Aran's home region where well the, the federation feel there's more support um, on a crowd level but also on a political level for the race so you know, that's going to be interesting to see. But the, as you say, there's no doubt that, um, well, this is the big um, sort of new, new market. I'm sort of hesitate to say new market because cycling in Colombia, um, well, it's a marriage that goes back a long way. The, the bigger mystery to me is, is how is this sort of period in the 90s um, up until the millennium where, you know, the supply line was kind of cut off of, of top Colombian riders anyway. Um but you know it, it's definitely the most exciting sort of new market for professional 
for professional cycling as far as I'm concerned. And it reminds me a little bit, you know, the last few years, usually on the back of someone winning the Tour de France, we've seen huge explosions of interest in certain countries. So, for example, in Denmark, we saw it when Bjarne Ries won the Tour in the mid-90s. Then we saw it with Germany and Jan Ulrich. And, and the next big one was the United Kingdom um, with Wiggins and Froome. And now there's no doubt that Colombia is the most exciting intriguing interesting force emerging in professional cycling both as far as the riders are concerned and as far as the the fans and support and interest is concerned i mean you say the supply line was cut in the 90s daniel but the the, the cycling culture in colombia is so deeply ingrained and so well established that you don't imagine there weren't talented young riders appearing in the 90s a lot of people put that the, their disappearance at the, at the top level down to epo yeah, I think that may well have been a factor. I mean, certainly people like um, Greg LeMond have espoused that, that theory in the past. Um, I think there were also definitely issues on an organisational level. Um, and, and, you know, we saw this, well, this current generation sort of flourish relatively slowly at first. But there were sort of behind the scenes things happening with the Cole de Portes team and, um, you know, various people kind of manoeuvring and um, and making it easier for young Colombian riders to come to Europe and at the same time I suppose you know the world has got smaller with things like um, well with with internet and the ease of access to you know the the races that are happening there people can watch them and and various different agents have, have got involved with the Colombian talent pools and they've made the supply line of of Colombian riders to Europe um, easier um, and, and now of course you're going to get this fantastic emulation effect I mean I, I can't believe that the, there won't be uh, what, the, an equally good generation in 10 years of guys who have grown up watching you know the Chavez's and the Quintana's and the, and the Bernal's and yet remarkably despite all these writers a Colombian has still not won the Tour de France and I noticed you put out a call out on Twitter today Daniel I think a year ago or so you you asked people the people of twitter to suggest who would be the first colombian tour de france winner um who, i mean who was it a year ago who people thought and and who is it today well, i think it was very close to poll between <laughs> superman and nairo man so it's going to be some kind of superhero um in a cape um but i and the consensus seems to be that it's still those two still probably represent the best hopes with the addition of egan Bernal. I don't think Bernal was at his best um, at the Tour of Colombia this year. He's probably still a little bit undercooked, and indeed, you could argue that there was well, there's a bit of confusion. Um, maybe in the Team Sky car on stage five, when whereby um, Sosa was down the road. Sosa man. Sosa man was down the road, and um, Bernal man um, or Sky chased behind him and. Sosa ended up losing the race by four seconds and, and that might have cost him his own team's tactics but um, Bernal is definitely well he's definitely positioned himself in the last 12 months as, as the heir apparent hasn't he um, having said that Superman had the best year of any Colombian last year he was on the podium twice in Grand Tours um, he's going all out for the Giro this year I don't know Rich I mean I, I look back at the the results from the Vuelta last year and and he lost a minute to Simon Yates who's you know not the greatest time trialist well he's certainly he's a rider of relatively small stature and and does pretty well in time trials but is by no means a pure ruler um Superman lost a minute to Simon Yates over about 31 kilometers in the long time trial in the Vuelta last year and he, and he kind of frittered time as well in the first week so um, you know th there's a lot of work to do there um can he find two minutes on a rider like Simon Yates? Can he find maybe four minutes on a rider like Tom Dumoulin, who's going to be up against in the Giro, particularly on a course um, which the, the time trial, the better time trialists among the Grand Tour contenders have identified as being favourable to them? Shoot, uh, shoot at l'arrière du peloton, cycling podcast team car, the back of the pack, please. The voice of Seb PK there reminds me to tell you that this week's episode of the cycling podcast is sponsored by 
The Economist. Now, you, as a listener to Second Podcast, can get a free print copy of The Economist. I'll tell you about how to get that in a moment. Um, but The Economist is the smart guide to the forces impacting your world. It's about far more than just economics and finance. It covers a range of subjects from world politics and business to science, technology, arts, the environment, and even sport. It helps readers prepare for what is going on in the world around them. The Economist sifts through the noise, focusing on the essential information that tells the real story in a time when facts matter more than ever. It's been a trusted source of intelligence for over 170 years, and it's for the kind of person who never stops asking questions and wants to know why the world is the way it is. Now, the article that caught my eye, and it's one close to your heart, Daniel, Mm -hmm. the singer and the song. It's all about how poetry slams in the Basque country are helping to revitalise the Basque language, especially among young people. There are events called Bertzolaritza, the Basque oral tradition of improvised song. Um, it, it's particularly popular, I said, about, among young people where um, they stand up before a crowd up to 500 people have been attending these events and they have to uh, basically invent a poem of between 8 and 12 lines which fits a prescribed rhyming form. Very exciting and thrilling, apparently. And as I said, this is helping to revitalise the, the language. Uh, there were 2,000 such events last year and what the statistic that really interested me and caught my eye um, we know that the Basque country is a, a proud place, it's got a great cycling tradition we've covered it on the cycling podcast uh, but a study in 2016 showed that 34% of people in the Basque country speak the, the language uh, Euskara um, that's up from a quarter in 1991 and it includes 70% of Basques under the age of 25 uh, Local languages, Daniel, I mean, we tend to think that the world is becoming homogenized and more and more people are obviously speaking English. And we're in Spain now where English is is more and more kind of prominent. Um, What's the picture like in terms of local, like Basque and and other local languages in Spain in particular? Well, Rich, I was with one of our colleagues, Pete Goding, photographer the other day. He was here for the Challenge Mallorca and um, he was getting in a bit of a flap. he He said, I don't speak any Spanish. Um, and I said, well, you don't need to speak Spanish in Mallorca because it's because most people speak Mallorquin, and um, which is a, a dialect of Catalan. But that is um, probably the most commonly spoken language in Mallorca. Um, people speak Spanish as well. But it, it's um, yeah, it's always interesting when we go around, we travel around, um, particularly well, Italy and Spain, um, to observe the regional dialects and, and how much they're used and by whom in particular regions um, you would think that regional dialects would be used more by old people and they're dying out that's not necessarily the case for example if you go to the Veneto in the, in northeast of Italy and um, there's a real been a kind of growing phenomenon of young people turning more and more to dialect in um, recent years and um, and yeah as I say it's, it's very sort of disparate picture in some places there's no doubt um, dialects and regional languages are becoming less readily used and in other other places they're becoming more readily used. Well, The Economist is a smart guide to the forces changing your world, so if you've never stopped asking questions, get your free copy now. Text 78070 with the word cycling. That's 78070 with the word cycling. Well, Daniel, as you said, we've talked in the last few weeks about teams that are attempting to reboot this year having had disappointing years Dimension Data uh, we heard from Mark Cavendish last week we heard from Katusha Alpsen a couple of weeks ago and another team uh, certainly hoping to do a bit better this year is Team UAE Emirates uh, they've been Team UAE Emirates for a couple of years now and I've, I've sort of struggled to uh, get results frankly um, riders have underperformed there uh, Alexander Christoph was a, a quite a big signing last year, as was Fabio Aru, who really disappointed. Dan Martin sort of saved their season with a, a spirited performance at the Tour de France, if nothing else. Um, and they have rung the changes over the winter. They've signed Fernando Gaviria, obviously. Um, they they won a stage in Colombia, thanks to, well, Juan Sebastian Milano. You told me that it's Juan Sebastian Milano rather than Juan Milano. Sebastian, he refers to himself as Sebastian. 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 Well, you know, it's, I'm going off Lionel's notes there, so it's Lionel's fault. However, um, 
He's another promising young rider, 24 years old. And they already look like a team this year, mainly thanks to Gaviria, um, who are at least going to win some races. Uh, but they've they've run quite a few changes in the backroom staff in particular. Yeah, they have, Rich, and there have been changes that have taken place over a, a couple of years, really. Um, you mentioned Molano there. Um, I suspect that... Uh, Machin Fernandez was very instrumental in his signing. Uh, Fernan- Machin Fernandez, I think we, we featured him in a Giro podcast last year um, when we talked about scouting. And he's the man behind a lot of the success that Quick Step have had over the last couple of years or last few years with young riders. He was the first scout, um, or, or the, given the name of a scout, um, in the World Tour at Quick Step for a couple of years. Then he moved to UAE to link up with. Uh, Mauro Gennetti, whom he used to work with at Sonia Duval. So uh, I imagine that people like Molano uh, were, were definitely on his, have been on his radar for a, a while. Um, there have been other changes in the sort of physiology, medical department. So they've got three um, new faces in that department, I think. Um, so Inigo Samian, um, Euron Swart, and Adri Van Diemen, formerly Greg LeMond's coach, formerly at, at Garmin. Um, and it's all looking quite different. I mean, it's a team that, you know, I spoke to various riders about, or I've spoken to various riders about over the last couple of years, and they've been fairly dismissive um, about the idea of joining that team, saying that it was basically the old Lamprey. Um, all the staff was Italian, um, had a, a, a quite a, a sort of traditional mentality, whether it be the doctors, the mechanics, the soigneurs, and slowly um, the, there's been a, a, a sort of sweep of a new broom through that team, and I think the results are starting to to materialise. Um, they they won about 13 races last year. Not enough, as you say. Um, Christoph looks as though he's coming to this year in good form. I noticed in Oman that um, he was at the front when it was a fairly select group um, when the splits had taken place. So he looks as though he's in the right place at the right time of the year. Um, Dan Martin is, is a guarantee, I would say. Um, he's become a very consistent rider, always offers you something in the in the most important period of the season and uh, uh, the big the big unknown I would say is Fabio Aru and how they get the best out of him he had an absolute nightmare last year and it we, we wasn't much better in 2017 so um, I'm intrigued to see how they how they're going to tease the best out of him well you need a goal scorer don't you and Gaviria is a guy who should win races for them and, and if they are winning races an awful lot else might fall into place they've got guys like Valerio Conti as well who's always looked really talented often makes mistakes and uh, he's not that young anymore um, he looks capable of winning races but if if someone like Gaviria is, is notching up wins it will take some of the pressure off some of the other guys perhaps um, I mean it's it's a really good roster that they've got now I mean they've also signed Henao Sergio Henao um, they have um, Diego Ulisi Diego Ulisi another young rider who I, I suspect was picked up by uh, Machin Fernandez was is Jasper Philipson who's already won a race this year Tade Pogasar I think the Slovenian uh, very highly rated young climber so I like how you look to me for pronunciation what? there Daniel <laughs> Slovenian not, my I'm thing not, is it I'm no expert on Slovenian but uh, you know, in terms of talent they're right up there now with the very best I also think in terms of budget they're right up there with the with the richest teams in the world now and, and they certainly have the ambition to be if not the best team in the world then close to it so um, you know those guys need to perform but as I say everything's kind of looking a lot better than it was well I spoke to Jeroen Swart last week he is a South African who will be familiar to some of you as a, a physiologist interestingly he's the medical director at the team he's not uh, part of the, the coaching department but he does have a lot of experience uh, and expertise as a coach he was also the scientist or one of the scientists in the lab when Chris Froome did his tests in London in 2015 wasn't it? 2015 you were there you were there Rich was it 15 or 16? well it was one of those two years anyway um, you might remember that story Froome had come under a lot of uh, pressure to do VO2 tests and other tests in the lab. He did that, and Jeroen Swart was one of the people overseeing those. So we featured him on the podcast quite a lot around that time. 
And uh, he's always an interesting voice on the subject of performance and also on anti-doping because uh, he's been heavily involved in anti-doping in South Africa. As he tells us here, he, his, invol- his official involvement in anti-doping will have to end now that he's uh, employed by a team. But his appointment really did uh, catch my eye. I was fascinated to see him take that step and join a World Tour team, uh, join the staff of a World Tour team, uh, given his reputation and uh, his, his expertise. So caught up with him last week in South Africa and here's what he had to say. I mean, Jeroen, we know we know you well from uh, uh, your work with well Chris Froome in the lab, but Ashley Moulman, Passio, and other athletes, and, and anti-doping as well. How did you come to be you know be appointed head of medicine at, at UAE Emirates? Yeah, well, it actually goes back to uh, about halfway through last year when I got invited to uh, do a keynote address at the Science of Cycling Conference, which is a conference which happens just before the Tour de France every year. And uh, after my keynote address, uh, I was contacted by Inigo San Milan, who's a, uh, a, a, like me, a a sports physician and a scientist who uh, works at the University of Colorado in Denver. And uh, he had been approached by the team uh, to uh, set up a uh, new medical and new performance team for uh, the coming season, which is the season we're in at the moment. And uh, we've been following each other in scientific circles and, uh, you know, on social media, people get an awareness of, uh, you know, your, your attributes and your and, and, and various other factors. And um, so he approached me and asked whether or not I'd be interested. And uh, uh, fast forward to where we are now, February 2019, and, uh, and here we are. It's a team that it's a, it sort of evolved from the old Lamprey team, and it, it has had a very Italian um, uh, culture uh, and backroom team. Um, do you have you felt so far that they're open to your input and to uh, really rebooting things because they've also been underachieving? I think it's fair to say the last couple of years. Yeah, I, I mean, objectively, they they, they didn't uh, perform that well. Um, last year and, and, and uh, the year before. Uh, I can't really speak to the reasons uh, why that was the case. But um, so, I mean, there was a, a fairly extensive overhaul and, and uh, in line with that, there's also a new sponsor. So, I mean, UAE stepped into the fold a little earlier than, than, than was planned. And uh, But this is a, uh, you know, this is a country uh, team. I mean, the team is effectively a national team with national sponsors and um, it, it's a long-term project. So, it, it has to have an international flavor as a, as a result of that. But as you pointed out, it's, it comes from historically a very Italian team. And um, obviously I had my reservations and I think other people did as well about, you know, whether or not uh, non-Italian speaking individuals would be able to fit into the team from a cultural and from a language perspective, and you know, whether or not there would be a very open culture. And uh, in fact, uh, I've been amazingly surprised and, and, and very pleasantly surprised about how open the existing uh, members of the team and staff have been and how welcoming they've been to all of the individuals that have joined the team and uh, in fact it's it, it's it's feels like a family and 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 everybody works together extremely cohesively uh, everyone respects each other so very very surprising at how well that process has actually uh, played out uh, so far and you've worked a lot um, individ- with, with athletes individually, coaching them uh, one-to-one. You're in, what's it like being in a team environment and in a, a world tour team environment? Have you have there been any surprises or you know anything that you've, you've seen that, that you really feel needs to be addressed? Yeah, you know, the, the thing about working with an individual is when they approach you, you know that they want to work with you. So there's an immediate buy-in they recognize your skills, they, 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 they want uh, what you have to offer. And when you come into a team environment, you always face the prospect of, you know, the team may be inviting you to be part of it, but you need to actually have the riders buying in. And in any environment where you, where you come in with 29 athletes, you always expect some resistance from some individuals. But so far, we've actually had very open acceptance of, of methodologies that they're not used to that they've never been that they've never used before that they've never seen before and, uh, and to a greater extent um, uh, you know the riders have adopted uh, all of these new 
protocols and scientific methods that we've introduced. And so far, I think we've we've had some great results. So um, it, 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 it's been pleasantly surprising from that perspective as well. And working within a team is, you know, in terms of that aspect, not ideal. But I think it's a, it's a challenge that I really uh, felt was something I would like to be part of. And uh, uh, it, it's a long-term challenge. So we'll see where it leads us in the coming years. And when we were speaking earlier, you mentioned well, two things that, that caught my attention. One was um, you've worked a bit already with Dan Martin and he's posted a, a very strong time trial already this year. Um, you also mentioned the uh, the fact that in your in your view, a lot of guys competing at that level are, are, are frequently overtrained, that that can be a real issue uh, for cyclists in particular. Yes. So my role is as the medical director and, and the key aspect there is to look after the health and the well-being of the athletes. Uh, we've got a separate performance director who's in Igor San Milan who I already mentioned and uh, his role is to look at all the performance aspects. But from my background in terms of my research and the uh, the skills that we are, as I said that I have from the services that we offer at our own sports science institute in, in Newlands, Cape Town, uh, the, the key areas where I've uh, added uh, value I think is in the biomechanics side where we have a strong research background and, and individuals who really understand psychic biomechanics really well. And one aspect there is the time trial. And uh, I think we've made some good gains in terms of the the, the, the the riders' positions on the time trial bikes, their ability to be produce power and, and, and be comfortable and stable. We're doing quite a lot of work still where we hope to make some more gains. But as you point out, um, Dan had a, a very good uh, time trial, uh, I think possibly his best time trial, finishing 10th on a, what was essentially a flat time trial until the very end, the last 500 metres was uphill. And uh, I know he was very happy with that time trial. So um, we've, we've hoped to make some further gains there with wind tunnel testing and, and other aspects that we still need to do. Um, and then the other aspect, is, as you pointed out, is, is uh, in terms of making sure that the athletes don't again end up overtrained and ill. And I, I think uh, uh, the last vast majority of uh, world tour cyclists are often in a chronic state of fatigue where there's this feeling that you need to do these excessive uh, training loads. And yes, you have to be prepared, but often they end up over-prepared and then as the season progresses, we see a lot of riders progressively actually underperforming. And often that's as a result of doing too much training. And we've done a lot of research in our university and, and in our department. I did some collaborative research with Professor Robert Lamberts, who's originally from Groningen, but who is now a professor at Stellenbosch University, but who was with us for many years. And we developed some systems to actually assess fatigue and training status with a submaximal test. And uh, those are things that type, types of things that we're implementing to you know keep track of the riders and ensure that they're not doing too much, that they're not excessively fatigued and that they respond adequately to the training. And obviously your reputation as well uh, is, has been forged in the anti-doping field in South Africa. I, I guess that's part of a big part of your, your remit as well in the team. And is that one reason why they've, they've brought you in to, uh, to bring some of that influence to bear on, on the riders? Not specifically to, to bring that influence to bear. I, 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 we do have rigorous internal protocols that we follow. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, because of the conflict of interest that it presents, I'm not able to do continue my work in anti-doping uh, uh, with regards to the sport of cycling. So I've had to uh, to give up that work where uh, I work for our own anti-doping uh, organization, SAIDS, in South Africa and uh, for the Salt Lake City Lab in the, in the U.S. So uh, I've had to discontinue that work. Um, and and uh, within the team, it's really making sure that uh, you know, we educate the riders about uh, uh, the use of medication, uh, what uh, to make sure that they know what's on the prohibited list, and uh, and we obviously monitor internally to make sure that if we see anything uh, that that we're not comfortable with, that we address that at an early stage. The cycling podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science and Sport for their support of the Cycling Podcast. You can still get 25% off your Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25. That's SISCP25. 
We don't have an expert's answer this week. Ben Samuels, our science support expert, has been otherwise detained, but we do have a, a bit of a backlog of questions, but do keep them coming in. Contact at thecyclingpodcast.com to email, or alternatively, you can send us a voice memo to the number. This is a WhatsApp voice memo, and the number is plus four four seven nine seven one three three eight two zero five. That's plus four four seven nine seven one three three eight two zero five. Like I say, it's a a voice memo rather than a phone call. If you don't mind, thank you, um, and thanks very much again to Science in Sport. Now, Daniel, the other story that has been rumbling away has been, well, a two-pronged sky story. One is whether Geraint Thomas will ride the Giro or not, and the other is whether Team Sky will have a a new sponsor, whether they will continue into 2020. Reports last week uh, were that um, Dave Brailsford was talking to people in Colombia. um, Gazeta della Sport, our friend Chiro Scogna Emilio, reported that Eco Petrol, were in the running to become the new title sponsor of Team Sky. That was perhaps premature. Uh, certainly, there's a good relationship being established in Colombia, and they've obviously got a couple of very promising Colombian riders at Team Sky. But um, I think you were privy to some rumours last week that there may well be interest, serious interest from uh, parties looking to take over Team Sky. And I've heard that now as well, that um, the future could be secured for Team Sky uh, quite soon. Yeah, um, the, the Colombian story, well, we, we talked last week, didn't we, about the why it might happen, why it might not happen. Um, I think we both heard in the last week or so that, you know, obviously talks did take place. Sky went with a big delegation of, of staff and sort of top brass in the in the team organization to Colombia and that got a few sort of antenna buzzing but and Brailsford said at this stage it's it's unlikely and, and I understand that um, it's certainly not if there is a negotiation um, taking place there's certainly uh, talks with with someone else another party that are more advanced yes indeed so that's what we've heard and I mentioned the Geraint Thomas story I don't know if it's connected in some way to the fact that the team is in this uncertain phase Um, but it's certainly notable that for a decade um, Team Sky have had a lot of continuity in terms of their partners Um, people like Pinarello who have been with them from the start and this story has has emerged of 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 not discord but a difference in the messages coming out of Team Sky and from Gary Thomas himself and Pinarello the, the bike supplier um, that Gary and Thomas, they think, Pinarello think, that Gary and Thomas will ride the, Tour de, uh, ride the Giro d'Italia. And um, Gary and Thomas uh, seems adamant that he will not ride the Giro. Well, Richard, it's worth remembering, A, that Pinarello is a, an official partner of the Giro. Um, and also that about at around about this time last year, we were talking a lot about Chris Froome and the Giro and why he was going to the Giro and he mentioned well people were, were talking about um, the possibility that he'd received a fairly sizable sum of money or that Sky had from RCS to ride the Giro so um, you know it's not inconceivable that RCS will have made Sky and or Garant Thomas an offer, a financial offer to ride the Giro um, it, it looks to me as though Pinarello might have either got the wrong end of the stick or he was trying to sort of entice Thomas into doing the Giro. I mean, their plans all along have been that Bernal would do the Giro as as the leader. Um, the course definitely suits Garant Thomas. There's a lot of a lot of time trialling. There's also the issue of of his cohabitation with Froome at the Tour. Can they, can they pull that off in another edition of the Tour? They did it pretty well last year, but... Um, and, and also Froome, I think... It's it's becoming fairly evident that Froome is a is a different animal this year. We talked a few weeks ago about how, and um, he's he's opened up about the toll that his salbutamol case took on him and and his training and the fact that um, he was distracted at the start of last year. And I think this year, uh, well, he looked in Colombia. He lost over half an hour on one stage, but um, generally speaking, he, he looks lean. He looks focused, and um, 
and you know that might make matters a bit more complicated with Thomas. It would be a feather in the cap, wouldn't it, for the Giro to have the, the reigning Tour de France champion. Um, also, also, though, if, if we're talking about, you know, no one really knows this, even <coughs> even La Gazzetta dello Sport, who, which is, to all intents and purposes, the owner of the, the Giro, they've never um, published any any in-depth information about this. But it, we, we all kind of assume that there is this slush front. There's a, a bit of a war chest um, that RCS use to, to entice the biggest stars and um, you know that's possibly been Chris Froome in the past, Tom Dumoulin uh, as well. Um, if you look at the number of riders, the number of top stars who have put their hand up for the Giro, you imagine they might already have been used up, whatever money is available for that kind of thing, because um, the field is looking pretty sparkling with, whether it be Simon Yates, Superman Lopez, Dumoulin, um, I'm, I'm forgetting. Primoz Roglic. Primoz Roglic. I mean, yeah, it's, it's stacked really, but... Um, there is this. Uh, I think the G- Giro almost senses that there's a moment in time as as the tour. I don't know. A lot of people seem to have turned off the tour as a, as a spectacle. Sky have made it a little bit formulaic and to some a little bit boring. And the Giro seems to have seized the moment in a certain respect. Getting Chris Froome last year and having the the end to the race that they had, where it was turned on its head. The previous year, Tom de Moulin being a very marketable winner and the year before that the the way in which Nibali won the race in the final week and Nibali riding the Giro as well of course this year um, there seems to be a sort of a growing momentum behind the Giro and uh, you know to not have either of Thomas or Froome they might consider that to be a slight step back to have Bernal instead of one of those two and so they might just pull out all the stops to try and Get I mean, I think the subtext of this is that Pinarello clearly would like Geraint Thomas to ride the Giro. They're obviously influential both with the Giro itself and with Team Sky. And the, the, I mentioned at the start of this discussion about you know the, the fact that for 10 years there's been total unity at Team Sky, total cohesion, both among the, the team, the riders, and also the, the partners. You know, th- this is the sort of thing that can happen when there's uncertainty that there, there, are, there are little fissures, little fractures in relationships. And although this, I'm you know, maybe exaggerating this, we don't know the extent of it, it's just one of those little things that, you know, one of these loose threads that you can pull away at and the, uh, the, the, the jumper, the pullover can unravel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you should think about season planning and... Um you know, who wants to peak when and what other objectives they might have in the season you know there's also the the prospect of a of a world championship road racing that's taking place in Yorkshire at the end of the year which the course is is not it's not the hilliest it's certainly um, nothing like last year in Innsbruck but you know uh, uh, speaking to Mark Cavendish last week he certainly thinks it's going to be a lot harder than people realize um it's very kind of grippy there's a lot of twists and turns and um, not much flat road the the final kilometer itself is is very difficult um there's a there's a, a real sort of dead turn with about 300 meters to go which you know could open it up to 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 punchy explosive riders so you know who knows that might come into a rider like Garrett Thomas's thinking and um, he seems to have turned his focus away from one day races he's not going to be riding the classics this year um and and you know you just don't know how a guy feels about having had one bite of that cherry the tour de france cherry is that in you know for some guys that may, might be enough it might be the achievement of a lifetime and they're quite happy to go off and pursue other goals for for, for some others um it could be irresistible that the, the the idea of going back and doing it again could be irresistible a man on a skateboard there, Daniel. A lot of skateboards around uh, Palma. Um, and, of course, surprised not to find you on your skateboard here. Yeah, I haven't got my skateboard today. Um, Mark Cavendish was, was zipping around on a scooter last week. One of those... Uh, what do you call... What's the official name? For the, just a push scooter. Just a... You know, you, you've got you've got a, small a scooter. Child. You should know. Yeah, a scooter. Yeah, you can hire them here um, with your mobile phone. Not an electric one. Uh, quite a few electric. electric. It yeah. wasn't an electric one. It was an e-scooter. Hmm controversial um, Pinarello, Pinarello is um, a sponsor of the E Giro maybe that's what Fausto Pinarello was referring to when he was talking about Garant Thomas maybe Garant Thomas is riding the E Giro <coughs> I mean just finally on that Garant Thomas his uh, whatever he achieves this year I think he just wants to start the Tour de France with the number one on his back feeling like he's got a good 
shot at repeating what he did last year and without maybe the Giro in his leg. Here's one for you. Um, who was the last rider to wear the yellow jersey in a prologue of the Tour de France? Because, because the defending champion used to be allowed to wear the pro, um, wear the yellow jersey in the prologue of the following year's edition. Was it 2003? I think it was Bjarne Reese in... Nine, was it not Bjarne Reese in 1997? Or was it... Or maybe maybe you're right. Maybe it was late in this. And I looked this up. I should know this because I looked this up recently. I don't know. I, I have a sort of vague recollection of Armstrong wearing the yellow jersey in the prologue in Paris in 2003 but I, I could be wrong uh, answers on a postcard please to the cycling podcast in Watford uh, where your missive will be received by Lionel Burney who's confined to his his own quarters at the moment Daniel should we wrap things up for now maybe we should Rich maybe we should ok we'll be back next week with our third wheel I'm sure Lionel will be back before we go I should just tell you that the February edition of the cycling podcast Femina has just been released and that includes interviews with Lucinda Brand who was second at the Cyclocross World Championships, Championships recently after a collision with her father in the pits um, Katie Archibald talking about her plans for the season and Danny Rowe who's just retired and a fascinating uh, interview with her talking about her reasons for retiring so that's Cycling Podcast Femina that's out now well Rich it definitely wasn't Bjarne Reese because Jan Ulrich definitely wore yellow in the prologue in Dublin in 1998 so it's sometime after then. It was probably the controversial Lance Armstrong. Well, there you go. That's all for this week. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you, Rich. You have been listening to The Cycling Podcast. Subscribe to our newsletter at thecyclingpodcast.com to get all the latest news and special offers delivered straight to your inbox. This episode was edited and produced by Tom Wally. Tom Wally.